Hello, and welcome to Lake Helen First Congregational United Church of Christ virtual worship service. Today is Amistad Sunday, on which we honor the moment in history when slaves aboard the ship La Amistad were rescued, um, but then jailed uh, in New York. And they were befriended by a group of abolitionists um, who belong to the churches that are now a part of our own UCC and took their legal case all the way to the Supreme Court where they were declared free. So on this day, we celebrate their freedom. I made a mistake last week on announcing our Gift and Go, which is not the last Saturday of the month. It is the third Saturday of the month. So in March, our Gift and Go on the Parish House porch will be on March 20th from 10 to 1. Our book club will be meeting on March 31st. Uh, it's a Wednesday night on Zoom. And we're reading the Book of Longings by Sue Monk Kidd. We are continuing our gatherings, both virtual and in-person. Our in-person meetings take place on Tuesday at 5 p.m. at Lewis and Karen's home. And on Friday at 3 p.m., we meet on the Parish House porch. Our virtual me meetings. We have a gathering on Friday at 7 p.m. on Zoom. And that is for scripture and prayer. And it's led by different individuals each week. And we ask you, if you'd like to join us, just give myself or Cindy uh, a message and we will certainly uh, send you the information. And on Sundays, we have another virtual gathering, which is purely social. And we gather at 1130, which would be the time of our normal um, fellowship hour after our service in the sanctuary. And it is with great pleasure that I welcome uh, Reverend Elliot Fay to our service again. And also this is Communion Sunday. So if you would like to pause for a moment and gather the elements that you would like to use for your communion, you can do that now. Let us worship.
Our lips sing praise and our whole selves rejoice in the God who makes us free. We gather recognizing that not all human beings have known this freedom. The divine will was made known in Eden and in Egypt, in Gettysburg and in Cape Town. Born in freedom, redeemed from slavery, our destiny in Christ is liberty. My peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Trouble not your heart, my peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Be not afraid, my peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Trouble not your heart, my peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Be not afraid, my peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Trouble not your heart, my peace I leave you, my peace. I give you. Be not morning. Uh, my name is Elliot Fay. I, uh, I, of course, have been with you these past couple of Sundays, and it's very nice to be with you again uh, this morning. And uh, hopefully it will work out uh, so that I will be able to be with you for the next uh, several Sundays, uh, through uh, at least through Lent and into Easter. Uh, and so I, I at least am very much looking forward to that, being with you, uh, even in spirit, <laughs> over, uh, over uh, this virtual uh, format. Well, this morning, uh, I would like to read to you from the Gospel of John. This is John chapter 2, verses 13 through uh, 22. And this will be a very familiar passage. Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both 
the sheep and the cattle. And he also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. And after he raised, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. When I was in uh, middle school, it seemed to happen less in high school and certainly less in elementary school, but middle school, those awkward years, uh, I recall uh, multiple times during middle school that a fight would break out during school. And it uh, usually happened that uh, this would take place uh, sometimes, uh, sometime during a less organized time of the day. So during maybe gym or, um, or during lunchtime in the cafeteria. Uh, and these, place, these things always took place uh, during school hours when other people were around and usually for a silly reason. Somebody said something that was insulting or was interpreted to be insulting or uh, something, something generally uh, uh, less than uh, significant would cause these kind of fights. And sometimes I think people just got in fights because they wanted something to, to, uh, to do and something that would gather a crowd. But when this happened, uh, there were, in fact, always a small group of people around that, uh, that, that fight that knew what was happening. But then there were all the rest of us, uh, whether it was in a, uh, uh, the playing field or in the cafeteria, there were all the rest of us in some other part of uh, that area that really weren't sure what was going on. We heard some noise, we heard a kerfuffle coming from that side of, uh, of the field or the cafeteria, but we really didn't know what was going on and most of the time we didn't find out uh, till much later that there had been some fight happening or some ruckus happening on the other side of the uh, cafeteria. Uh, when we heard these kinds of things, we just kind of focused on surviving uh, the next uh, 45 minutes or whatever it was until the next period, uh, surviving with uh, drawing as little attention to ourselves as possible. Uh, in our reading this morning from John's Gospel, we have... Uh, the account of Jesus's rather surprising actions in the temple. And this is one of the accounts uh, that appear in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in the old uh, Jesus movies, um, uh, that's, that's often where we draw our picture of, of events in the life of Jesus. Uh, one of the old Jesus movies, like Jesus of Nazareth, I recall uh, seeing this scene and in those kinds of movies, it's always depicted or set uh, on uh, the, uh, the front of a building that's maybe like one of the, the city uh, government buildings or maybe the Deland Theater, some, some setting like that where there's a, a set of steps and a, a handful of doorways but, but a main entrance and there's a handful of tables out front and a handful of sellers at those tables. Uh, and what happens, of course, is Jesus uh, goes up those steps and he knocks over those uh, five or six tables and drives out the sellers and effectively completely cleanses the temple. That's the, the picture that's, of course, conveyed in these movies and, and perhaps the picture that we have in our heads as we read or hear this account. But... Uh, as we consider this scene, that as it actually took place in the life of Jesus, we need to remember that when John says Jesus went into the temple, he wasn't talking about a little space like the Athens Theater or one of the, the government buildings in downtown Deland. He wasn't talking about a small building and a, a, a set of staircases where there was a primary entrance. He was talking about a space that was over 
35 acres large, over 35 acres in space. Now, I tried to uh, Google map 35 acres in, in Lake Helen, and the best I came up with is if you were to start at the church, at, at uh, Lake Helen Congregational Church, and drive down towards the library, and then take a ride at the library over to Lakeview, and then drive back up to Main Street, and then come back up to the church. That square that that, that creates is about half the size of the temple complex that John is talking about in our passage. Maybe a little bit easier would be if you can uh, think of Blake Park uh, down the street from the church. Uh, if you can imagine four Blake Parks, that's about 35 acres. Uh, so we're talking about a really big space. And into this uh, temple complex, there were uh, hundreds of thousands of people that poured every year. Uh, and particularly during those, those times of pilgrimage, there were truly thousands of people pouring into the temple every few days. So as Jesus entered the temple, what he would have first encountered is this really large outer courtyard. Now, the temple proper was admittedly a little bit smaller. It was in the sort of the center of the, the temple complex. But there was this massive courtyard that surrounded the temple, and that courtyard composed the vast majority of the temple space. And it's here that John tells us that Jesus observes these booths. And there would have been hundreds of booths uh, that would have been... Uh, 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 filling this space. And at these booths, there would have been uh, uh, goods for animal sacrifice or places where you could exchange money to get the required temple currency, all kinds of things like that where religious pilgrims could get the stuff they need or exchange their money so that they were able to, to do the things they needed to do in the temple. Now, thinking about it that way, it seems like this is kind of a convenient thing to do. Uh, this made it so that you didn't have to haul all of the stuff you needed to the temple for temple worship. Instead, you could buy it right there in the courtyard. Now, sure, it, this meant, uh, this, this temple courtyard space was meant, ideally, to be a space of prayer, but it certainly made the sacrifice process a whole lot easier for everyone. But, John tells us that as Jesus walks into the temple and he sees this, what he does is he goes over to a, a couple of these booths, a couple of these hundreds of booths over in one corner of this big temple complex. He goes over and he begins to overturn their tables and he begins to chase away the sellers and the buyers. And he begins to chase away their animals, all the while chastising these people for making the house of God into something less than it should have been. Now, as dramatic as this sounds, it does sound dramatic, uh, these actions of Jesus, we want to remember, would have practically been very, very localized. Right? Jesus certainly would have drawn a crowd of, of observers, but realistically, this only disturbed a very, very small part of the overall temple dealings. Jesus' actions are, are, in effect, a little bit like that middle school fight where he would have drawn a small crowd, but the vast majority of folks would have been completely unaware of these events, and they just would have kept going on, buying and selling, uh, getting their animals, changing their money, just like they would have on any other day. And so... These actions of Jesus, uh, they weren't done. Jesus doesn't do them with the intention to actually cleanse the temple, to actually drive out all the buyers and sellers, because that would have been impossible. Remember, we're talking about a massive space with hundreds of tables and thousands of buyers. And that would have been an impossible task. So instead, these actions were meant to reinforce or demonstrate Jesus' frustration with the fact that uh, the act of making a sacrifice, the act of making a sacrifice, had become so important 
that it was actually inhibiting true worship. We'll say that one more time, that the act of making a sacrifice had become so important that it was actually inhibiting true worship. See, in Jesus' time, one of the ways that people worshipped was through sacrifice. But the act of offering a sacrifice wasn't necessarily worship. What made it worship was the person's gratitude and repentance and humility and trust in God that was represented in that offering. It was the motivation behind the giving of that offering. Right? It was those attitudes of worship that were meant to be the the heart and the motivation behind these sacrifices. Sacrifice was simply the way that worship was expressed, or one of the ways that worship was expressed. But the temple, their, their attempt to streamline this uh, process of worship uh, encouraged the means of worship to be a priority rather than the attitude of worship uh, and prayerfulness that were the things that God was more interested in. And so Jesus teaches, when you do away with the attitudes of gratefulness and conviction and dependence and trust uh, behind the actions of worship, when you do away with the inward stuff, you just end up with empty actions and self-satisfied religion. And it's better to just turn over the tables and go home. And so this is what Jesus does, at least representatively. Turn over the tables and send people on their way. Not to try to, again, literally cleanse the temple, but to, to cause them to realize that true worship may involve sacrifice, may be expressed through sacrifice, but it must be more than just the act of offering a sacrifice of the giving of an animal. We might think of it a different way, since sacrifice is not one of the common means that we use to worship. So instead, worship might involve the singing of a hymn, but only if we invest that singing, invest in that singing more than just our voices. Uh, worship might involve the taking of communion, or the saying of an invocation, or a call to worship, Worship might involve the lighting of candles or the reading of scripture. But ultimately, what God is interested in is the stuff behind these actions, the motivation, the heart behind these actions. It's the investment of our hearts that makes singing and candle lighting and reading scripture worship. It's the investment of our hearts that makes communion more than just an inadequate end-of-service snack. During this season of Lent, this season of self-reflection, may our hearts be present in the things that we do during this time together, even together virtually, so that for us, this Sunday service might truly be a service of worship. Would you pray with me this morning? Gracious God, we thank you so very much for this uh, reminder again that comes through the pages of Scripture and through the actions of Jesus that you care about our hearts, that, uh, that our motivation behind the things we do is important. It is so easy, uh, particularly during times like this when we find ourselves uh, separated uh, from those familiar uh, traditions and separated from each other. It's particularly easy during these times to just go through the motions, to just hear the hymns played over the computer or over our phone and to just listen to the sermon and to just feel separate from these, uh, these means, these uh, means of worship, but I ask that you would help us in these coming weeks to remember uh, that these are just means of worship, that uh, what's truly important is the motivation and the heart behind these things. And so during this time, we 
ask that you would open our hearts to you and that we would open uh, our hearts to you. That you would draw out from us greater trust, more faith, all of the things, gracious God, that you care about seeing in our lives, so that we might be more like Christ and so that our faith might be deeper and fuller and more life-giving. And so we ask these things in Christ's name. Please join your hearts and minds with me in prayer. We thank you, God, for all the blessings of this life, love, freedom, bounty, and beauty. The joy we know is beyond our words to speak. We can only imagine the suffering and pain of human slaves, past and present, which yearn from the depths of their souls to know the freedom we enjoy. We celebrate this day, the heritage we have in the cause of human freedom. We celebrate this day, our spiritual ancestors who worked for the freedom of the Mendi people on the slave ship Amistad. May that ship, like the cross, remind us of the ever-present possibility of human evil. And may that ship like the cross, remind us of the power of divine love. May we, through divine love, shed the false, unneighborly, covetous, and dishonorable desires of the lives we sometimes live, and keep the commandments and walk in the way that brings life. In this season of Lent, we reflect on those things that lead us away from the life we desire. We focus on whatever we do that oppresses and enslaves others who, like us, are created in the image of the divine. And now we seek the grace that frees us to live in faithfulness to holy love. Holy God, we pray for people who are victims of crime, from petty theft to murder, we pray that those harmed will find healing and dwell in safety. Hold especially close to your heart, O God, those who have lost a loved one to violence and help us to offer tenderness and care in their struggles and grief. We pray for healing and reconciliation where trust has been broken hostility has flared or misunderstanding has grown. Restore us not only to one another, but reconcile us to ourselves and to you, loving God. In every relationship, we seek your grace as we honor others by caring for them, being truthful and working for their welfare. Root out in us any jealousy toward what others possess and let generosity grow in and among us instead. Gracious God, we pray for those whose names are on our prayer list. You know them, who they are, what their needs are. We ask that you hold them in your tender care. Send us out in love with open eyes, ears, and hearts. Make us true neighbors to one another and true children of your own calling. God of grace, hear our prayer and hear us as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
just as I am without one plea, but that your blood was shed for me, and that you called inviting me, O Lamb of God, I call. Whether you want to use juice or wine, even coffee or tea, I invite you now to go and have those items ready as we prepare to dine at this table. For this table represents the table of mercy. It's the table of grace. It's the table where Jesus says for us to come as we are to dine and share the meal. For it was at this table where Jesus gathered with his closest friends, those who knew him well and intimately, those who walked with him and talked with him, and they all gathered for the meal. And it was at that table where Jesus took the bread, he blessed it and gave God thanks, and he broke it. And he said to those gathered at the table that this bread represents my body that has been broken for you. Let us now together partake of the bread. And then after the meal, Jesus took the fruit from the vine. And Jesus lifted it up and blessed it and gave God thanks. And he passed the cup to each and every one of them, saying, This cup represents not just my blood, but this cup also represents love and hope and peace. For this cup is for each and every one of you, for all of you are welcome. Let us now prepare to share together the cup of love. And so I invite you to pray with me Loving Creator, God, we thank you for this bread and we thank you for this juice that represents your Son. We thank you that it represents the unconditional love that you have for each and every one of us. 
that lets us know that we are all truly welcome and invited at this table. And as one, we say together that your son, the prayer that your son taught us to pray, and we say it in a language that's familiar with us, and we say it by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. Go into the world without fear, knowing that the weakness of the holy is stronger than every human power. Live free. And the God who brought the Israelites out of Egypt, the God who freed the Mendi from slavery, will be your strength and your power. Amen.
star you and hated, shone or insulted, because of the sun, the sun of men. Blessed, oh blessed indeed are you. On that day rejoice, exult with joy. Your reward in heaven, oh how great it is. Blessed, so oh blessed, indeed are you. Oh, to the rich who have their comfort now. Oh, to those who shall be deprived. Blessed, oh blessed, indeed are you. Woe to those who laugh, who laugh in emptiness. They shall weep with tears, with tears of grief. Blessed, oh are they who know that they are truly poor, for they stand ready, ready to be filled. Blessed, oh blessed, indeed are you. Thank you for attending and viewing our virtual service. These are certainly strange times, and we have had to learn and do new things as we closed our doors to keep the congregation and community safe and healthy. But COVID-19 has not stopped Lake Helen UCC from being the church. We are the church from home. We are always here for you. There are several ways to find out what we are doing and how you can reach out to us in your time of need. Find out what we're doing through our website at lakehelen-ucc.com. That's lakehelen-ucc.com. Or on Facebook by putting in the search at Lake Helen UCC. That's the at sign at Lake Helen UCC. Our email address is Lake Helen UCC at CFL dot RR dot com. Again, Lake Helen UCC at cfl.rr.com. Our phone number is 386-218-5976. That's 386-218-5976. Thank you, stay safe, be blessed.